and we're going to talk about the written side of things for, for a little while here. Um, and I want to just start by following off with something that Paul just said in his talk, some of you were there at that, where he was basically saying the problem for a lot of people applying for jobs is that they're in a very crowded mind. You're applying to somebody, there could be 300 people, there could be 500 people, there could be 5,000 people applying for the same number of limited positions, and there's only a few minds have to process all those applications. So one of my first principles, I didn't intend talking about this, but I'm going to take two minutes on it because I think you'll find it useful. One of my first principles is, if you're going to go fishing, you need to go fishing in a way that is, is practical in terms of, of, you know, it can't be overcrowded. I like to go fishing down in Dunleary with my kids. Um, not a very good fisherman. Occasionally I meet a suicidal mackerel who throws himself onto my hook. It's very nice when they do. It's not really about catching the fish. It's about having hot chocolate. It's about having marshmallows. It's about spending time together. And if we happen to catch a fish, that's great. If I was fishing seriously, I still don't think I'd want to do this, which is first day of open season on I don't know what river in Canada. Because no matter how shiny and attractive your bait, no matter how well, well, well primed your fishing skills are, if there's a limited number of fish and a vast number of hooks in the water, the signal to noise ratio is not in your favor. And the same holds true for job hunting. Now, you've probably seen this model at some stage already today. This is Daniel Perot. You'll find it in What Color Is Your Parachute? It's absolutely superb. And what he's talking about is how companies hire. So what they want to do is they start from within and they build slowly in terms of trying to fill, if that's a pyramid of let's say 100 jobs, these are the ways they will fill their jobs. And it's only at this point that they go public and they start talking about advertising maybe on their website or they'll start looking at the, you know, the hopper full of CVs or, the, or, the, or the, the file drawer full of CVs. There's plenty of room at the back guys, trot on in. So that's the way companies approach it. And of course the problem is job seekers approach it typically from exactly the opposite route. And they consistently miss out on opportunity because of. So I hope that what Sinead was talking to you about earlier on and Paul was talking about to you, Peter Cosgrove was talking about more or less the same subject. Accessing the market is what it's all about because there are fewer and fewer jobs visible. They're all buried. <laughs> And you've got to go digging to find them. I don't care how well written your application is. I don't care if it's engraved with diamonds on, on filigree sheets of gold. If it's in there with a thousand other applications, it's going to get lost. Don't go the front door route like every other bozo. Find the side door, find the back door, dig a tunnel, go under the snow. That's my first and largest piece of advice from this afternoon. Second, okay, let's talk about the fundamentals. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of making what you do do quality and worth reading and something that I'm not just going to flick my way through. This is, this is a process of concision. And one of the most famous writers of the last century was Ernest Hemingway. He, was, he wrote some of the most sparse and spartan, beautiful prose. And there's, a, there's a probably apocryphal story of somebody challenging him to write a, a, a story in six words. And these are the six words that he wrote. Never worn. Why do they have to sell them? Why were they never worn? How hard up are they now? I mean, it just, it causes you to think of so many possible ramifications out of that tiny, tiny number of words. That's great writing. It doesn't matter if it wasn't Hemingway who did it. Whoever came up with that, you have to bow to that. By contrast, I got a profile on a CV from somebody a little while ago that read like this. That's 88 words. That's a dense paragraph. It was about five lines, I remember, on the page. And this person, because they were trying to compress more onto their CV, had reduced their font size to size 10 to start with. So it was already a bit of a squint job because it was a printed CV that I was reading. 88 words. How many words should you have in a quality written application on a CV? How many words should you have? Depends. 
My brother is a scientist. He's got a 56-page CV. He's allowed. He's been published for the last 30 years. He has to list all his publications and presentations and all the other stuff he's done. Docs have this problem. Scientists have this problem. Their CVs swell to an enormous size. For you and me, unless you're Booters Booters Galley, I would suggest you want to be on a page, page and a half, max two pages. And I would suggest that your word count needs to be a thousand words or less for your CV. He just wasted 88, giving me a little bit of background, but not really particularly usefully, and certainly in a very swollen and bloated way in terms of the words that he was using, and the word count that he's using. You've got to write sharp and tight, because there you are, <laughs> in the middle of the pile. Hello, <laughs> cooey. This is like everything else, I guess, in nature. This is something that we can put on a bell curve. Um, and for those of you who've forgotten primary school mathematics, about two-thirds of the population of anything you care to measure will fit in the middle of the bell curve, either side of the median line, that dark red line. And when you go out one standard deviation from that, you're looking at 96% of the population being in the average to, you know, very, very weak to very, very strong average, but they are still average, they are not exceptional. It is only that last few percentage points on either side, the outliers, who are ex extraordinary in the eyes of, in this instance, the reader. So how do you get yourself over here? Now, clearly a huge amount of this is going to be about your content, and it's going to be about whether you were the editor, or the auditor, or the treasurer, or the heavily involved, or the organizer, or the coordinator, and all those things that one does when you're pursuing a third level or postgraduate qualification. Clearly all of those things count and matter. Clearly internships and summer jobs and the kinds of responsibilities that were devolved down onto you, and whether you were made a key holder for a store that had two million euros worth of stock in it, which tells me a lot about you straight away, these things all matter. But how you express those are more important. Because the problem is, when you've got the post-grad qualification, when you've got the PhD, when you've got the, you know, the high honors in, in, you know, and you came top of your class or in the top five in your class out of a class of 400 in your undergraduate qualification, that puts you over on the right-hand side of the bell curve. And then we put you on a new bell curve. And that last few percentage points swells to be the whole bell curve again, and now where are you on the new bell curve with all the super bright, super qualified editors, auditors, treasurers, honorary secretaries, etc. So, it's all about understanding how the other side is viewing you, how tired the other side is of reading tiresome applications, and pulling yourself away from that nasty, average, first draft feel that most of the CVs that I read have. In other words, it's about having an edge. You've been watching Mr. Nadal hammering all comers at the, uh, the French Open in the last week and a bit. I really, I just, I weep for anybody who ends up on the other end of the court from this guy. He's like some kind of terminator. How do you get that good? Well, Andre Agassi wrote his, um, his, his autobiography a couple of years ago, and he talked about being seven years of age facing two and a half thousand tennis balls every day coming from one of those machines, you know, two and a half thousand tennis balls a day at the age of seven. His father had set the net higher than regulation, so getting the ball back over the net was a Herculean task to start with. And he'd stuck the machine up on stilts and it was shooting balls down at this little boy at his face, at his chest, seven years of age. Two and a half thousand balls a day is seventeen and a half thousand balls a week. I have not hit that many tennis balls in my whole life. That's how you get an edge. That's not just about talent, that's about hard, hard slog. Now, how can I apply that when I'm sitting in front of a keyboard? Well, there's very simple things you can do. The first of which is recognizing that you're in the middle of that heap and that ain't good enough. Now, here's my first question. I didn't want to keep reading after I read the first 88 words of that guy's CV, but I decided I would because I was being nice. He spent the next 350 words describing a six-month contract job where he did absolute bog-standard accounting role. 
he was doing trial balances, he was liaising with the other marketing department, he was talking with the revenue, he was talking with the auditors, absolutely fundamental stuff that any accountant would do and as soon as you see the job description, the job title, you know what that guy is doing all day and he wasted 350 words telling me that. His CV ran to over 3,000 words. What possibility was there he was going to end up on the shortlist? In a competitive market, pretty much none. So what happens to your CV? Has anyone here ever hired other human beings? Has anyone here ever read a big pile of, of CVs like this? Yes? No? Hand up? No? One or two? Okay. It's kind of soul destroying. It's awful work. It really is. And you're conscious that you're holding someone's life in your hands to a certain extent. But guess what? You get over that pretty quickly particularly if it's a large pile, and particularly if it's Friday afternoon, and you're a little weary. So, here's my question. If I have a pile of 50, or 100, or 500, or 1,200 CVs in front of me, when I'm doing my first scan, my first pass through that pile, am I selecting, or am I eliminating? What's my mindset? I'm eliminating. I'm, with no malice in this world, looking for a reason to chuck you in the bin. And it's not personal, I promise. I am looking to get it down to, that's what, it, that's what it looks like. That was a job we did a while back. That's what it looks like. They're the rejects, they're the possibles, that's the shortlist. When you print them out, that's how big and bulky they get. Now. Give me, give me a reason to put you on the possibles pile on first glance. That's the first thing your CV has to do, okay? It has to say, this person's in the frame. This person's a possible. And how do you do that? Well, I remember David Brent, you know, the Ricky Gervais guy from the office. He was saying one of the most important things to do when you're hiring is to avoid unlucky people. So what he does is he takes the pile of 100 CVs and he throws them down the stairs. And whatever's on the bottom half of the stairs, he doesn't read. <laughs> One would hope that there's fractionally more science <laughs> to the approach been taken by other people in the marketplace. <laughs> but I do the Guardian uh, CV clinics and the career clinics and whatever else, and I keep getting asked exactly the same questions over and over again about the fundamentals of how to put myself across in writing. And in fact, a lot of those questions aren't about writing at all. They're about route of entry back to our fox under the snow. They're about sidelining that route of entry to your advantage and getting in to the market in a way that maybe other people aren't thinking about, getting noticed in a way that other people aren't thinking about. Because if I'm hiring, and I sit working with companies on this kind of stuff all the time, I don't want to read 500 CVs. If I can short circuit that process and read five and pick one who's a known quantity, I'm going to do that. And that's you, the first thing you hear about that opportunity in that job is you see the, the company announcement, you know, the puff piece in the Sunday Business Post. Oh, Joe Bloggs has just joined such and such a company. I get calls, unfortunately, from clients on a fairly regular basis, on that exact basis, which is, Rowan, did you see the Sunday Times or the whatever it was, the trade magazine, page 42, Joe Bloggs just got hired as the widgeting engineer for Widgets Incorporated. I was in college with Joe. He's an idiot! I can't believe he got hired for that bloody job. Hmm, says I. Did you know the job was out there? No. When was the first time you heard about it? When I heard about Joe's good fortune. Gotta be under the snow. Gotta be under the snow. Fundamental, central to your thinking has got to be tired person, Friday, 4.30 in the afternoon, just finally cleared his or her desk to get to the pile of CVs. What can I do to make that person's life easier? Because if that person is beaming at me, metaphorically or literally, there is a greater chance that I will end up on the shortlist. That's fundamentally what it comes down to. So, if you send me in a document that uh, has funny wonky fonts on it, and I end up with my machine substituting Arial and Times New Roman, as, as most of them will do in Microsoft Word, you have a font substitution problem, and your beautifully formatted document falls onto 74 pages instead of three. Okay, maybe that's fractionally exaggerated, but it'll happen. Things go all over the place. Your beautifully formatted tables 
it springs off on the right hand side. Do you think I'm going to go back and print that document again or try and fix it online so I can, you know, I can squint at it and read it on my, on my screen? Probably not. Not if I've got 49 more or 149 more documents to get through. DocX. You'd imagine at this stage that everybody would be able to open DocX, but guess what? And particularly in public service, they're not. It's a very regular problem. I would constantly save as a .doc or a .rtf, which is a format you may not be familiar with, which is called rich text format. Because any word processor under any operating system will be able to open the latter, and nearly all of them will be able to open the former. WPS comes from Microsoft Works. I still get those. I get those from the person who bought the cheapy Dell computer and doesn't have any actual software on it, and they're therefore using Microsoft Works and they send it as a WPS, which is openable by nothing. <laughs> nothing can crack open a WPS file. So unless you have works on your system, forget it. RTF or .doc. Colors. People send me colors on their CVs that I can't see. And I know I'm middle-aged and old and squinty and stuff and cranky to boot. Don't make me cranky. Make my life easier, remember? So, a quality application will not have any of the big sins. Let's talk about the big sins. The first four are obvious and easy. They are being careless, being too, too uh, wordy to say, the real, to say it tight and short, your overall document length getting very out of control, or you not being a good fit for the job in the first instance. Those are the big four, and I encounter those constantly. Let's address them quickly. The first one is, well, not... Not carelessness, sorry, no, that was a mistake, sorry, no, no. This was one I came across recently. First thing on his CV after his name. Engineering professional. Nice. That really made me want to read on. It's almost a cliche, it happens so often. Now, this, in the modern era, with the red squiggly underliny thing on your, on your word processor, really is into, into inexcusable territory here. Whatever about substituting T-H-E-I-R for T-H-E-R-E. -E, people do that, or you're and you're. Don't get me started. That's inexcusable. That means you're a careless asshole. Okay, have I come off the fence enough for you on that? <laughs> Little more subtle, but it's there. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Love this one. <laughs> What would have made that one perfect was if the person was either a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> now, here's the other problem. There isn't a diplomacy checker on your computer. People write this stuff. Or my all-time favorite. <laughs> More of a night bird, I'm guessing, yeah? You've got to be so careful. And then you've got to think about when it starts coming together. So here's an example profile that I got recently. Um, have a quick look. And let's have a look, shall we? I don't like ampersands in written speech. Now, if you're talking about training and development within a big sentence, then the, the ampersand is appropriate. If you're talking about an and here, it should be an and. Initiative and speed are vital? Yes, I would have thought so. So again, what happened there was the person wrote it, rewrote it, and didn't check it. Ampersand. This is interesting. That's a relic from the web. Somebody in copy and pasted that sentence in from the web and never read it again. 
10%. And my all time little favourite on the bottom of this one. I think, in fact, I'm just trying to remember, I'm pretty sure this person was a native English speaker. And yet that's what came across. Got to be careful, folks. I'm going to labour this point because Mr. Cosgrove, who's talking in the other room about interviewing at the moment, uh, their company did a very interesting survey that I came across a few months back where they read all the CVs that came through the door for a month and it was some massive thousands of CVs that came into CPL recruitment. 92% of them had errors. And if I'm in the mind of eliminating rather than of selecting, <laughs> you just welcome to yourself to the bottom of my bin. Here's my big seven. If you write those, make sure you mean those and not these. I can't tell you how often somebody tells me that they are defiantly, when they mean definitely, very good at something. And anybody over the age of 35 hates when you get it wrong with apostrophes. And unfortunately, a lot of the people who are out there hiring are over the age of 35. I rant about this on my blog. Actually, probably to a very unhealthy degree, but it keeps the ulcers at bay. It's good. It's good for me. So you have to bear with me. And remember, spell check is your friend up to a point. Oh, lordy lord. <laughs> so typos, actual spelling mistakes, formatting inconsistencies, glaring grammatical errors, you know, square bullet points on one section and you know, further indented in a different color and asterisk shaped bullet points on the next section. Search and replace stuff is you know, very obvious when you've done that on the CV. All of these constitute that kind of carelessness and that's a reason to flick you into the bin. Very easy, makes my life very easy as a hirer. Don't recommend doing it. Second, wordiness. To paraphrase George Orwell, bullet points good, paragraphs bad. Combination of both, probably your optimal. So I wouldn't recommend doing nine bullet points in a row because no matter what, the eye is looking at that going, oh man, that's going to be hard to read after a little while. I would do four or five. I would then break it with a sentence or two. I would go back and do my second four or five bullet points. The probability is you should be distinguishing between responsibilities that you've held and contributions and achievements. And that's two sets of bullet points would be the way I'd express that. And I'd put a little line in between in some way expressing that the bit that follows is the cool stuff I did over and above. We'll talk more about that later. As I said at the beginning, you've got to write really, really tightly, really, really sharply. So example. Passive, 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 passive. You didn't make anything happen. You were floating around in the current, you know, been washed downstream. So obvious. In fact, I don't even like the I. I would start with a capital R, reduced, expanded, moved. You do it impersonally. Take the, the perpendicular pronoun out of your writing as much as you can. It's not attractive to the eye. Now, I put that up at seminar after seminar, and people say, ah, Jesus, Robo, come on, I'm not that stupid. But guess what? I read that kind of passive terminology every day. So huge swathes of people out there do this. Try and not be one of them. Try and get somebody, if, look, if you're an engineer and you're profoundly left-brained and you are not good at, at human expression, as many left-brained types are not, get some friend of yours, get a, you know, your godmother who's a beautiful turn of phrase and has, you know, writes wonderful prose to read your CV and say, dear, don't know if that's the best way of putting that. Ask for input. Let's not presume that this is something that you can do by yourself. It will always be a better job if other people have cast their eye over it. One of the things that's, that's hardest to do is proofread your own writing. It's very hard to do because you're so familiar with it and there's something about, I wrote that, it's great. It's not. It's a first draft. For the most part, it looks and feels like a first draft. I see all this sort of stuff happening. 
I even did this on a CV I had years ago. Um, I used a, 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 an in-term, in in-company in terminology. I said that I was the, uh, the regional coordinator for Area 4. And a friend of mine looked at it and said, what? Where's Area 4? I said, you're Middle East Africa. And he said, well, why didn't you say that? Oh, yeah. You forget. You're so close to it. Looks and smells like a first draft. You're in my bin. Get your wording tight, sharp. Length? <laughs> Let's play CV bingo. Does anyone here have a CV longer than three pages? One, very brave soul. Two, very brave souls. What do you do? PhD in physics. PhD in physics and? Uh, just going really nice Splendid. Going for academic posts? Then you're allowed to have a three page CV. Going for? Okay, but have to include all that? What are you including that's, that's stretching it that far? Is it posters and publications and stuff? Well, I have a lot of work experience as well, Okay, uh, that's the bit you're going to need to compress because vast amounts of that are going to be of very little interest to whomever's reading it. If you look at your CV with three pages or more on it, and at the end of every sentence, from the perspective of the person who is filling this job that you are applying for now, you crawl into their head and say, so what? At the end of every sentence. If there isn't a good reason or a good answer to the so what, that sentence shouldn't be there. Very crude rule of thumb, very useful in terms of editing your own writing. Definition of a CV? Operative word? Say no more. <laughs> One page, be great if you could get it that way. Very few people can, and the American resume style doesn't resonate here in, in, in Ireland or in Northwestern Europe, so depending on where you're applying. Australia, likewise, they like a bit more detail. Canada, likewise, they like a bit more detail. America, get it on a page. <sighs> now, that is hard without just reducing it to font size eight. Maybe two. Two is okay here. Now, if you're over the age of 30, I'm interested in the last five to seven years. If you're a young, newly, newly minted graduate, I'm interested in the last two things that you've done. And everything before that is out there with babysitting, as far as I'm concerned. And that's the reality. And your education section, which at the moment is taking up two thirds of a page, unless you're going for a job in education, I'm probably going to stop reading at BSc in whatever and whatever. And after that, I don't care what your thesis was in, I don't care what your, you know, your major project in third year was in. Might be vaguely interested, as I say, depending on what you're going for and what electives you took in your, in your final year or two in college. But you can go for the most part. Now, you're going for the law, fine. They want to know every result you got all the way back to the junior cert, because they're neurotic that way. What can I say? How do people address this? Typically, they do it this way. <laughs> now, the next thing that I'm going to put up is the most important thing I'm going to say all day. OK? <laughs> Got that? <laughs> Mr. Sam Goldwyn of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the, the famous movie studio, he was a very hard man to pitch to, and he was very impatient and very intolerant. And there's the famous story of the young English writer coming over and sweating profusely in the Hollywood uh, weather. And he's sitting in Mr. Goldwyn's office getting ready to pitch. And he draws breath. And Goldwyn put his hand up and says, John, do you have a calling card? He says, yes, sir. He hands over his calling card. And Goldwyn didn't even look at it. He turned it over, slid it back across the desk blotter. And he said, write your idea for your movie on there. And if it doesn't fit, you don't have a movie. Make it short. Make it tight. I get a lot of people who've read my books or visited our website or my blog or follow me on Twitter or whatever else it might be, send me through a document and start the conversation going by basically saying, Rowan, I want you to pimp my CV. I want you to, I want you to turn me from something that is definedly not what this job requires into looking like it is. And I'm saying to them, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you invite that level of stress into your life? Quite aside from the ethics of lying on your CV, which I think is a monumentally stupid thing to do, regardless of the fact that people who keep winning The Apprentice keep doing it. <laughs> that's not real life, that's TV! 
Here's my, here's my litmus test. I call it the mother test. Okay? You see a job advertised. There they are. There are the requirements. Okay? That's the kind of terminology we're looking at. And we see this kind of stuff all the time. I'm going to disclose here that I got a D in my Leaving Certificate Physics examination. Not really wired for that kind of thinking, it turned out. Also, not enormously motivated at the time. Didn't study it very much. Predicted with almost 100% accuracy what came up in the exam. Lamentably, hadn't studied all of it. Would you want me running a nuclear power station if your mother lived there? <laughs> That's fundamentally what it comes down to now, isn't it? So if you see essential and must have and you don't have it, if you don't have a, a side door or back door route into that organization, save yourself the effort it takes to hit the send button or the licking of the stamp and the envelope and don't. Go for jobs that you can do. Go for jobs that you can excel at. Why would you invite that stress into your life otherwise? So those are the, those are the four killers. They're the ones that, that, that are easy to go whish, 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 whish through. The next ones are, are trickier. So the, the next one uh, follows what I refer to as the idiot in a hurry rule, okay? And this was, this was a legal precedent that was set in California, which was, was the, there was a piece of labeling on a, on a, I think it was a food product, and, and the, the defense was, or sorry, the prosecution argument was that an idiot in a hurry wouldn't notice what it said on this because the labeling was so badly written. Now, let's just presume that you're sending your CV to me and I really am an idiot in a hurry when I'm reading large piles of CVs. You need to give it to me up front. The newspaper parlance is that you don't bury the lead. If there's a useful and important piece of information, that's your headline. That's the first thing that I read. By the time you know, I, I have to pull out the, the, the magnifying glass and be going back and forth between the two and three pages of your document, trying to reference what it says here in training with what it says here on a gap and so on and so forth, I'm losing the will to live, much less the will to finish this CV. Don't make it hard for me. By the time I'm two-thirds of the way down page one, I should be making my mind up as to whether you're in the frame or not on my first pass and maybe on my second pass again on a CV. Generally, I'll go through three or four passes on the same document if you, if you make it down through each successive pile. First pass is the hardest one to get past. That's where you need to give it to me up front. So wasting 10, 12, 15% of the, of the landscape of the front of your document with the words curriculum vitae across the top, don't recommend it. Wasting all the landscape on your contact and personal details at the top, don't recommend it. Jump in. Give me your name, tell me what you are and what you can do for me and what you've been doing most recently. And by the time I'm halfway down page one, I'm going, yeah, okay, looks like what I'm looking for. Possible. It's amazing how many people don't do that. I don't care if you have to commute from Mars. I don't care where you live. So don't tell me your address is the second thing on the document. I don't care. That's your problem. Put it at the bottom. It's the least important factor in terms of me making my mind up about you. Make it whizzable. <laughs> Make it whizzable. So when you look at the four things that comprise the majority of your document. You've got your section headers, your dates, your companies, your job titles, and obviously your body text. How do you delineate those out? Now, a lot of people go and take a template off the web. I do not recommend that. I don't recommend that because, again, a lot of these things will revert to type because there'll be all sorts of archaic artifacts sitting in there from Microsoft Word, and the person who's really skilled with Microsoft Word can edit their way around those macros and whatever else. A lot of people can't, and what also happens when you do that is it ends up being identified as spam. A lot of those things come with a little friend, whether it be a macro or whatever. It may have no malice in it whatsoever. I mean, you may have got it from a reputable book with a CD-ROM or whatever stuck in the back of it or a downloadable links off our website. I don't recommend it. Number one, you look like everyone else. Number two, bad things can happen to your document in transit. So what about the way you split this out? in terms of how, how you draw the eye down through the document. Look at it like this. If you underline your dates, I put them in a different font in small caps. 
companies in this instance, I'm thinking, all right, the companies you've worked for thus far are probably less important to me than the job title you've held. Whichever you think is more impressive goes in bold. So in some instances, that's going to be the, the job title. In some instances, that's going to be the company. That means when I'm scanning down the front page of your CV, I can go piece of bold type, piece of bold type, piece of bold type, piece of bold type, and go, ooh, those have been four interesting titles, and I see progression there. I can then go back up to the top with my eye and go italic, 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 italic. Oh, worked in reputable organizations, took a good internship, took a summer job here, took a year out of college or a gap year or whatever, working there. Interesting. Ding, 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 ding. Make it really whizzable for my eye. And the body text is the body text. Just make sure it's big enough where I can read it. <laughs> Design. Yeah, sorry, I mean. Design really matters in this world. Design really matters in this world. This is, this is you know, we're back into the, the Madison Avenue people here and their thoughts. Why are people willing to pay, you know, a few pence for this and a few hundred euros for that? It comes down to design and feel. Functionality, no difference whatsoever. You've all heard the story of the difference between the American approach to writing in space when they were in the early days of the space race, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing a pen that could write in zero gravity, and the Russians, brought a pencil. <laughs> like they're thinking. Why is it that you can go into Tyrac and buy a square meter of printed silk for 30 euros, but if you go to Salvatore Fargamo, you expect to pay several hundred euros for the same square meter of printed silk? Well, okay, I guess the fact that you hire Claudia Schiffer and they bring her to Monaco for the photo shoot is giving you hints in this regard. But design really, really matters here, folks. So your font choices are important. They matter. Not least because of that substitution problem I was talking about earlier on. Now, if you're not happy with Arial and Times, or Verdana and Times, Verdana is not a particularly good font for CVs because it's a very wide and fat font. It's a greedy font. It takes up an awful lot of space, and you get very few characters in per line. I don't recommend it. Calibri, obviously, is one of the newer ones. It's nice, it's tight, but it's easier for online and, and screen reading than it is for printed reading. I'd use it for headings rather than for body copy. For body copy, you're probably better off with a serifed font because they're easier on the eye. If you're fairly confident that your document is never going to be read in the printed form, well, then you can do what you want. How do you delineate out the document? How, at a glance, do I go from training to education to extracurricular activities to personal contact details to work experience to early career to profile? I need to be able to instantly pick out that big section. That means good use of fonts. That means maybe gray shading or a box behind it so that it really stands out. That means white space above and below it so I can really see by proximity this is the heading for the next section below. And what are you doing? You're leading my eye down through the document. Let me show you what I mean. Senior management account reporting the financial controller, blah, blah, blah. OK. Now, what we got here is we have Four sentences, four, four line, two sentences, is it? Yeah, two, two and a half sentences. Nice and tight. Few bullet points, then split out with bold, draw the eye to it. These are the contributions. This is my over and above stuff. Look, I took it from a legacy system to SAP. How clever am I? Nice white space. Again, nice separation in terms of the, the, the font style on the, on the headings for the titles, sorry, for the, for the dates, so you can see again. We're on to a new section now. Very clean, very clear. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Design matters, ladies and gentlemen. It really does. How many people here own um, a, an MP3 player of some description, either in your phone or, or a separate uh, a MP3 player? Yeah? How many of those are made by uh, Apple? iPods, iPhones, <coughs> iTouches, yeah? How many people in this room own a Microsoft Zune? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I, so far, in asking so many audiences that, I've had one, and it was a present from somebody who worked in Microsoft. <laughs> Design matters. <laughs> Finally, this is the tricky bit again. I call it all tell, no sell. It tells me a whole lot of obvious stuff that's really obvious. God, that sounded so much better in my head. Here I am, it's Friday afternoon. 
And here's the problem. I wrote the job description. I wrote the advertisement specifying what we're needing. I decided with HR or line management or whoever it was what the specific title and grade of that title would be within the organization. So when I see those titles on the CV, I know what it is you do. It's like trying to sell a car to me by telling me that it has four wheels and some seats. I kind of expect that. Likewise, when it's a QC analyst, when it's a cost accountant, when it's a warehouse assistant, I expect certain things. And I know from you having held that title in any kind of an organization, unless it's a complete backyard, you know, startup company, the likelihood is you'll have held the core functions. So don't be wasting time telling me about the features of the car. Tell me about why that makes it good. Have you ever seen anyone sell a car? It's fascinating. They'll sell a bog standard 1200 cc, 1400 cc, you know, small sedan car. And you listen to them talking to the retiring couple who are trading down, and they're talking about the interval between uh, may, you know, maintenance checks, and they're talking about the economy and the reliability of it, and you're talking about you know, how long it'll be before you need to do this, that, and the other, or replace the tires. You hear them selling the same car to some young fella, and they're talking about torque and poke and. <laughs> It's surprisingly nippy away from traffic lights. And it's the same car. The benefit that you're selling of yourself may vary from application to application. So what I would produce is a core CV that no one in the market sees. And your core CV is everything. Everything you've ever done, everything, every difference you've ever made, every contribution you've ever made, every responsibility you've ever held, every training course you've ever been on, self-funded or otherwise. Every seminar and conference you've ever attended. And then when you have a specific opportunity in front of you, you start deleting. You take out the scalpel. Core CV. It's something that very few people do and it shows because it makes my life easy when I'm chucking CVs away. By the time I'm halfway down page one, remember? Most CVs follow the RON seal rule. It tells me exactly what it says on the tin. So when I see management accountant, when I see financial controller, when I see, you know, junior QA analyst, I know what you do for a living. Tell me what else you've done. Back in the day when the Jacksons were very popular before they started changing skin color and giving themselves new heads for Christmas and stuff, um, Janet Jackson had a song in the 1980s, I think it was maybe the early 1990s, called What Have You Done For Me Lately? What have you done for me lately? And all the women used to gather around the handbags and point at their boyfriends while <laughs> they were singing this song. That's what the CV reader is thinking. What difference have you made? I know what responsibilities you've held with these titles. What difference have you made? How did you contribute in terms of this sort of stuff? Did you put your hand up for it or was it forced upon you? Doesn't matter now. What matters is you now have it on your CV and you can use it. What difference have you made? I don't hire responsibilities. I hire people who've made a difference. I hire people who've, yes, of course, held the appropriate titles and have, yes, have cut their teeth and done all the things that one wants to see in the, you know, somebody progressing in their career. But I hire people who make a difference. So go back to our example here earlier on. Our senior management accountant put, along with the typical audit analysis and so forth responsibilities, my brief also encompasses. So he hasn't talked about the core stuff. He's saying, that's in the job title, and I do it anyway. So the only thing he's delineating here are the differences he's made. The over and aboves. If we fundamentally distill the selection process down to one question, the question would be this. We hook you up to some alien mind reading device and we ask you one question. Now, that's of course requires you to know a lot about the organization you're applying to and have mapped yourself over it and all that stuff that they're talking about in all the other seminars and it's absolutely true. But you know that long-winded one that they ask? Oh, we're well done on getting this far. We met lots of interesting candidates. Rah, 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 rah. What do you believe marks you out as the best person for this job? It's a killer question. What makes you so damn special? <laughs> it's a killer question. That's what you've got to answer. Seth Godin's take on this I loved.
I do it. Stunningly great work. Shipped and finished. <laughs> I do it. I put full stops at the ends of my sentences. I do it. I draw lines under stuff. I'm finished. I do it. You hand me something, you can forget about it, because I'll get it done. I do it. In the military, they have a parlance. They refer to something called a, fi a fire and forget missile. A fire and forget missile would typically be a heat seeking missile. So you point it at whatever the hottest thing might be, which might be the engine on a tank or an airplane in front of you or whatever else it is, and you hit the button and you know you can just turn your airplane away and fly home because you know what's going to happen with that missile. It's going to hit the hottest thing in the site, which happened to be the engine that you pointed it at. What you want to portray yourself as is a fire and forget missile. You hand me something, you don't need to ask me how it's going. It's done. Convey that on your CV. <laughs> Convey that in a couple of pages. Here's a way of looking at your history that you might find useful. Because it's very hard to pull some of this stuff out of your, of your, your dredge these memories up. We do all these things all the time, but we don't take note of them. So here's, here's what to do. Take a page for each job or each contract or each piece of part-time work, whatever it might be that you have done. Divide it down the middle and say, OK, first day I arrived, here were my responsibilities, here was my budget, here was my level of, of control, here was the, you know, the various factors that, that define the success or failure of my contribution in this job. And then a year, two years, three years, ten years, whatever it might be later, this is what it looked like three years later, and I'd cascaded on this extra responsibility, and I'd taken a training course in blah, blah, and become the in-house expert on PowerPoint or whatever it might be. And that way you can see your own visible progression within the same job description. You might not have changed your job title at all, but I bet you what you were doing on a day-to-day -day basis looked a whole lot different on day thousand than on day one. Think about that, pull that out. Because otherwise you're into all tell no sell. So there they are, the seven sins. <laughs> to help you with this, I'm going to put um, some stuff up on the, on, on the website, which you may find valuable. Um, we'll do a CV vocabulary and an abbreviated form of the profiler from my most recent book. I can't give you the full version of this because my publisher is an arse. Sorry about that. But I'll give you, a, you know, as much of it as I can, OK? And we'll put that up at fortifyservices.com forward slash gradireland.html. It's fortifyservices.com for, forward slash gradireland.html. That should be up by tomorrow. It's not fun out there at the moment, folks, and I know that. And here's what I would quietly say. By the time someone comes to talk to us about getting their CV really properly polished and shined up and, and you know, serious approach taken, for the most part what has happened is they've applied for a number of jobs that they were eminently qualified for and for some reason they were not shortlisted. If that's happening to you, I quietly go back to Benjamin Franklin and others who have said the definition of insanity is conducting the same experiment over and over and expect you to see different results. If it's not working for you, go back to a blank sheet of paper, start thinking of it as your advertisement for yourself, because that's what it is. It's got about 20 seconds to capture my attention, like, a, like a, an ad on TV. And start doing what the advertising people do, which is getting into the other person's headspace. Don Draper's a millionaire in Mad Men because he's good at getting into other people's heads. He understands what motivates them and drives them. I love this remark from the, the ad age. You've got to crawl into their heads, folks. My name is Rowan Manahan. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much. You can find me on uh, rowanmanahan.com.